You will call the September 24th meeting of the Caroline County Board of Supervisors to order. All board members are present. Present, Mr. Black representing Western Caroline, Mr. Seeley representing Bowling Green, Mr. Underwood representing uh, Reedy Church, Mr. T Akers representing Madison, and Mr. Taylor at Port Royal, and I'm Floyd Thomas representing Mattapanai. Uh, I've asked Mr. Akers if he would deliver the invocation for us, and then before you start, Mr. Stork, could I borrow one of those two gentlemen to start us with the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> Next week. We try to let one of the youth folks come to the podium and help us in the pledge. Are there any other young people who would like to volunteer? All I have to do is start saying, I pledge allegiance. Is there one in the back? If not, I'll consider myself young. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Akers, if you'll do the prayer and I'll do the pledge. Let us stand, please. Our loving and wonderful Heavenly Father, as we come together this evening to conduct the business of this county, we ask for your blessings, we ask for your guidance, and we ask for your wisdom. Lord, we pray that all that we do and all that we say and the actions that we take will be pleasing in your sight and always keeping with your will. We thank you for loving us, we thank you for blessing us, and we thank you for all that we have as a people and as a county. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Mr. Cully, do we have any uh, addendum to the agenda? Um, yes, Mr. Chairman. We have a closed, uh, closed meeting we would like. That's it? <coughs> I think that was the only one. That was the only one? Okay. We're going to have a closed meeting, uh, I guess, after closing board comments. So there will be a closed meeting today. It's on the agenda as normal. No other changes, Mr. Black. You have a question about one of the consent agenda items. We might as well pull that off now. Uh, yeah, can we go ahead and pull? I mean, I guess we'll do it now. Uh, consent item D, please. Item D, uh, capital purchases and reserved funds. There's some issues Mr. Black discovered at the Ladysmith Fire Department. That is correct. Okay, so we will make that part of new business. Uh, 14A. That works. If yep. there's no objections, we'll take a motion just to make sure. If you'd like to make a motion, that effect. Mr. Thomas, I'd like to move that we um, move consent item D to new business 14A. Second. Motion made by Mr. Black, seconded by Mr. Akers. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. The motion carries unanimously. We'll uh, have the agenda fixed. Okay, at this time, I'm going to ask the, the Chief Loftus if he will come forward. Uh, we have a recognition. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, Chief, give me one second. I was moving on. Uh, opening board comments. Mr. Black? None. Mr. Seeley? I have none, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Underwood? None at this time, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Akers? None at this time. Mr. Taylor? Uh, yes, only that I would like to announce that uh, I have a constituents meeting on November 30th at 7 o'clock at Upper Carlisle. I'm sorry, September 30th at 7 o'clock at Upper Carolina and October 3rd at 7 o'clock at Port Royal. So all are invited. That's all I have. Thank you, sir, and I'm, I'm glad you reminded me because I have a, a few. Uh, last week I attended the Commonwealth Transportation Board reception in Stafford. Uh, one of the things that was mentioned was Quentin Elliott, who's the district administrator, said with the new tax structure, Theoretically, we will increase our revenue in the region from 180 million to 400 million. And that's the Fredericksburg region, so that's Stafford, Spotsylvania, Caroline. We'll see what our share is from those, but that's the general gist. And uh, also last week, I attended the 
work session with the middle school students at the 38th Parallel Project. That's going to be dedicated this year uh, on November 11th, which is Veterans Day. So they're actually going to do that Veterans Day, which I think conflicts with uh, the VACO conference. I'm going to come back for that, which gets me to the other one is we have VACO credentials. I'm going to give those to Mr. Cully and probably ask Mr. Taylor fill those in so that you could be the voting delegate there. And also ask Mr. Taylor if he could attend Friday at 11 o'clock. The sheriff has been awarded a Army tactical vehicle for the sheriff's department, and they're making that transfer Friday at 11. I have a previous commitment, so I can't make it. And I believe that's it. So, okay. Now we get to presentations. Chief, you're close? Okay. You most of us, when we go to work, it's not really a life or death matter. But when our public safety folks go to work, it definitely is a life or death matter. And we wanted to <coughs> recognize who, who, those who performed well under such uh, circumstances. Yes, Chief? Sir. Uh, I'd like to call up uh, some individuals um, or a representative. Uh, District Chief Stephen Melson, uh, Dist uh, Deputy Chief Richard Mediak, Captain Edward Bonham, Fire Medic Mark Liverman, Lieutenant Calhoun, and District Chief, Assistant District Chief Victor Abielfi. You guys. Every day, folks in our Caroline County Fire Rescue System, the men and women, whether it be career or volunteer, provide outstanding service to the community. Uh, that is without a doubt. There are certain occasions, like the ones we're going to talk about today, in which the public themselves <coughs> took the time to write in to talk about their experience with our fire rescue system. We have the four of those such events. On July 19th, crews were already working a motor vehicle accident on Route 1 in Page Road when a call for a second accident came in. A motor vehicle accident at the intersection of Anderson Mill and Sizer Road with entrapment. Ladysmith District Chief Stephen Melson responded and arrived alone in Engine 2. He began to assess the situation and started the process of patient extrication from the vehicle. The entrapped patient suffered from a concussion, two cracked bones in the pelvis, and various cuts and bruises. He later was joined by Medic 228, which was manned by Captain Ed Bonham and Fire Medic Mark Liverman. Lieutenant Justin Calhoun arrived in Squad 2. Deputy Chief Ricky Madiak cleared from the first accident along with uh, Victor Pobielski arrived shortly after to assist. The family member of the injured driver wrote in a letter describing the interaction with the crews and the level of service delivery she witnessed and experienced not only at the scene but all the way to the hospital and in the ER room. Stating, they understood we don't ride ambulances. We don't go to the emergency room on a daily basis. Everything was explained and all of our questions were answered. I want you to know that my family and I appreciate their service. So I present to you the crew from that call. Right. You have to go up. And we've got two more. Yes, sir. So before we move, we're going to have them stand. We'll just bring them all up. Yep, and Pam, do you have the certificate? I've got them. Yes, sir. I've got them. Gentlemen, if you'll just come back here behind us for one second. Hey, buddy, just walked in. They're from the next one. Okay. Do you want to keep them up there and keep going? I'm going right. to keep them here. I like, you know, I like having these guys behind me, so that's good. All right. Go right ahead. All right. If I could, uh, the next call, Assistant District Chief Eric Chennault, who wasn't able to make it, he's working. Uh, Firefighter EMT Aaron Monroe. Firefighter EMT Wesley Stork. Fire Medic Dave Perrier. And Firefighter EMT Luke Heller. If you all could come down. Kind of like the Price is Right guy. <laughs> well, 
All right. On July 21st, in the Bowling Green District, both Engine 1 and Medic 1 coming out of Bowling Green Station responded to an injuries from a fall. The patient had fallen and struck their head. This patient moved from being conscious and breathing to unresponsive and ultimately into cardiac arrest before crews arrived. The family member writing a letter to us stated, they treated my dad quickly and skillfully and were able to get a spontaneous return of circulation, thus means they got the heart to start as well as breathing prior to the arrival of the, or prior to the arrival to the emergency room. They treated my mom with such care and compassion during the entire call. In this case, the family member who was writing this letter, who took the time to, to write this thing about her experience, was a member of the fire EMS community in a different county. And so it's not often that we get praise from someone else within our business uh, for our crews, because they do it on a daily basis and they expect a certain level of care. And for her to sit down and write her experiences down meant a lot. It was the father that was injured, but it was how he treated the mother that she really was impressed with. Also with a spontaneous return of circulation, that patient had a positive outcome as far as we're concerned. Great. Right. Thank you, guys. All right. The last two we'll take together, if that'll be OK. Uh, we have uh, fire medic Mark Liverman. Firefighter Curtis Mason, uh, Fire Medic Mallory Harberger, Fire Medic Mark Liverman again, and Lieutenant Raymond Velasquez. Jake? I've also asked a representative uh, from the HCA hospi hospitals, uh, Spotsylvania Regional in particular, uh, to come up here and say a few words. The crews of this ambulance call, which is two calls, we won't go into the detail of the call, um, were recognized for their rapid identification of what's called a STEMI. Uh, it's an elevated ST rhythm uh, that's a, basically a precursor to a massive heart attack. The benefit of the STEMI program overall is we recognize these rhythms in the field, we treat that patient and communicate what we have found to the ER very quickly, and they transition that patient to the cath lab immediately and began to put a balloon in the, in the arteries that's occluded, uh, thus avoiding that, that problem. All right. Uh, twice in the last 30 days, Carolina County Fire Rescue Units were recognized by Spotsylvania Regional Medical Center for the rapid identification and treatment of two critical patients. In both instances, <coughs> the crews responded to an unknown situation and through their tremendous dedication and pursuit of excellent patient care, immediately recognized that their patients were experiencing a condition called a STEMI. And we've talked about what that is. Uh, both of the patients that were treated uh, by our crew and transported to Spotsylvania Regional left the hospital under their own power um, and are back in the community. Um, they essentially averted someone going into a heart attack uh, within the community. So Jake, oh, if you want to add? Thank you, Chief Loftus. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my name is Jake Marshall. I'm the EMS coordinator for Spotsylvania Regional Medical Center. On behalf of the entire hospital, I just wanted to say it's such a privilege to be here to celebrate these tremendous EMS crews. As the chief already explained, uh, STEMI is essentially a heart attack, and it goes without saying. You see it all the time in public service announcements and recruitment videos for the fire departments that in an emergency, seconds count. And I'm here to tell you, in these two calls in particular, every second that this crew, these two crews, save these patients directly uh, saved their lives. In a heart attack, every second that blood flow is not going to the part of the heart that it, that's blocked off means that millions of cells are dying and may not come back. Uh, their, their heart function may never return to normal. So the, the big thing that these two crews did is that not only they recognized that it was happening, but they quickly and efficiently did every single thing in the protocol that they're allowed to do. They started multiple IV lines. They uh, gave every cardiac drug that there was. So by the time that they arrived at the hospital, uh, we had our cardiac catheterization lab team, including our cardiologist, in the room waiting for them when they arrived. And they were able to almost immediately go straight from an ER bed to the cardiac cath lab where their blood flow is restored. Uh, heart attack care has come 
an amazing distance in the last decade alone. And a large part of that is because of the advances that pre-hospital care ha has made. It's tremendous. We, we took a condition that was easily a fatal disease and have almost made it as curable as, uh, as a cold um, by, by the teamwork between pre-hospital care and the hospital. And I just want to say how much we appreciate uh, the tremendous care that these two crews rendered. Thank you so much, and it's an honor to have uh, a good team uh, behind us here in Carolina County. <coughs> Thank you. And for him, we appreciate it. Mark, we'll get out of the way. And um, Chief, would you like to join sure. join your uh, troops for a photo op? I probably want to get a little closer anyway. How about four, three, and then two in the front? You three guys want to, he's going to move you around anyhow, whatever. Or, or maybe size, please. Um, it's, their, it's their deal. It's their deal. Okay. Now, sir, in the white, in the back, just a little bit. Okay. You want to step forward? That's it. There we go. Okay, just so we don't have this. Uh... Okay, you can put your hand down so I can kind of relax a little bit there. for me. Oh, uh, are we shy? We're shy? Okay. You're shy? You're in the front shaking your head saying you're shy? Oh, you are not shy at all. Alrighty, our next uh, presentation.
comes from the tourism department. We have been working with the tourism department on some catchy phrase or name for the whale that exists in the visitor center. Mrs. Beard took it upon herself to go to the schools and recruit names from all the students. We've had some great names. Um, there were a lot of Carolines. There were a couple of uh, funny ones like sushi. But the best name in the entire list from all the schools in Caroline came from that young lady right there. And her suggestion was Spouticus. So it's like, I am Spouticus. <laughs> exactly. So we're going to have a big uh, campaign behind that. But as Mrs. Beard is going to read through, there are prizes for not only her, but the entire family. Mrs. Beard? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, board and senior staff. On behalf of everyone, we really would like to honor the Morris family and their participation in this particular competition. We had 576 entries from all the elementary schools in the county, and as, as we know, Spadicus was the winner. As part of their gift from the county, they all have received a season pass to the State Fair of Virginia starting this Friday. They've all received uh, whale t-shirts, which are in their bags up here at the, on the stage, and they've all received hats. So we're very excited to present the Morris family to you, and Kyrie in particular, who came up with the name. Kyrie, is there something that you would like your mother to say on your behalf? You don't have to say anything. Mom, would you like to say something? You good? Okay. Um, Mark, would you like to take their picture there or take their picture around the whale? Kyrie, would you come on stage, please, so you can, the whale is, uh, Kathy, the whale is theirs, too. Yes. And we are also presenting them with a picture of the whale. The whole family. Because she looks like she's going to the guillotine. <laughs> I don't want to be up the road. I'm guessing she saw all you guys. me to follow this. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I realize that this is a dry subject, so I will be as brief as I can. <laughs> no pun intended. Uh, um, as the board is aware, 
Um, we are under a deadline to adopt new stormwater management regulations and other reporting documentation by July 1st of 2014. These regulations or the preparation of these regulations have been in effect for several years and there were two separate bills uh, approved by the General Assembly and signed by the governor. Uh, one set of bills directed the Department of Conservation and Regulation uh, to develop the stormwater program. And I think everybody thought that that stormwater program would be an integrated program where you would consolidate Ches Chesapeake Bay stormwater ENS together. Well, the language said that those regulations may be integrated and did not require them to be integrated. At the end of the day, once DCR finished uh, developing those regulations, we did not have an integrated program. So we effectively still have three separate programs that we will be required to administer effective July 1st of next year. We'll have the old Chesapeake Bay program, we will have the old ENS program, but we will have a new stormwater program um, that has come down from the Commonwealth of Virginia. Subsequent to that, the General Assembly also directed that these programs be transferred from the Department of Conservation and Recreation to the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. From a staff perspective, we think that's a good thing. All of the environmental programs will now be under uh, one regulatory agency, um, and we believe that agency understands the issues that have been created uh, with the regulations in their current form. The memo kind of outlines all the issues that we will be facing or the county will be facing as we go forward uh, with the uh, preparation and adoption of these regulations. I think I can summarize that uh, basically with, with three words. Confusing, duplicative, and expensive. And no, we don't have the answer to what all of those costs are going to be. <coughs> because we are still learning the regulations. DEQ is still learning the regulations. And we are still trying to, to develop our path forward to implementing those regulations. Nonetheless, we have a timeline that we must follow. The first step in that timeline is to have a draft uh, submission of our ordinance and other supporting documents to the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality by December 15th of this year. That will require staff to present a draft to the board for you all to review uh, prior to that date. And it is our intention to have a draft to you for your first meeting in November. I would suggest it is not prudent for the board to actually adopt regulations at this time because they will still be subject to review and perhaps modification by DEQ. Final adoption is required in April of 2014 with the program to be effective July 1st of 2014. And we intend to meet those statutory time limits uh, in terms of our preparation of the regulations and supporting documentation uh, and, and submitting those to the agencies at the appropriate time. Ms. Cosby has worked on a number of <coughs> Uh, ordinances for some other jurisdictions. We also had the assistance from the George Washington Regional Commission uh, in preparing a draft for us to consider. So we feel like we are well on the way in terms of uh, ordinance reviews to prepare an ordinance for the board to consider uh, as well as the supporting documentation uh, that will be necessary for that program. Uh, as I said, I understand that this uh, is difficult reading, um, 
Mr. Black has been to a number of the Chesapeake uh, or the Rappahannock River Basin Commission meetings. Uh, I think he's been uh, uh, well briefed uh, through the uh, commission on the challenges that we face um, and asked that uh, we put this on the agenda tonight to update the board and, and let the board as a whole uh, know the challenges that are, are forthcoming. Uh, Mr. James, who serves as staff to the uh, Basin Commission, uh, has also prepared some uh, uh, materials that he would be more than willing to share with the board as well. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fincham. Uh, I know this is the first run through. Any questions for Mr. Fincham at this time? Mr. Seeley? Mr. Fincham, some time ago we had either a C blad or an E blad sort of Chesapeake Bay regulation. Does that still stay together in this new set of stormwater management, Chesapeake Bay Act stuff? Yes, Chesapeake Bay regulations are still in effect. Uh, they were recodified this past spring as part of the transfer to DEQ. Um, so the Bay Act is still in full force and effect. Thank you. Any others, Mr. Akers? I, I do. Uh, I was talking to someone from Hanover County today, and, and I understood them to say that they had been briefed by staff, and, and I realize Hanover is much larger and has much more of an issue than we would in Caroline, but, but I'm, I'm thinking he said it would, that they were given an estimate of about $252 million. Yes, sir. They, they, they have a different level of program than we have, um, and they have different standards that they have to meet. They have centralized storm sewer program that, that they have to um, meet the requirements for that program as, as well as the other regulations. What I also have not talked about is the uh, TMDL program, which is yet another program out there that we know is coming down. Um, we're just not sure when and how that's going to uh, impact us. But yes, Hanover County uh, staff did a study related to all of their programs. Right. Um, the staffing levels, the um, inspection loads, et cetera, and did come up with a very significant uh, uh, cost for the implementation of that program. I think that cost is a total cost. Some of that would be de um, uh, development borne. Some of that would be you know, additional staffing needs for, for the county, et cetera. Our approach is that we're going to basically go forward with a program that minimizes additional staffing to the extent possible, relying on third-party inspectors where we can, um, utilizing to the extent possible our existing inspections program. But I will also say that the regulations, because of the duplicity in the different levels of program, it does not lend itself to consolidating inspections and, and there will be a lot of overlap which will be more cost to, to homeowners, uh, to, pro, to POAs, um, as, as well as the uh, uh, development community. Do you have any idea as to when you're going to be able to talk in terms of cost as far as Caroline, total cost? We hope to, to introduce the board to, to that subject in November when we present the, the draft ordinance to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, um, are there any funding uh, that we may be able to look at as far as trying to implement? Uh, and we are certainly a long ways from implementation, but I guess are there any funding uh, kind of with this that we may? Uh, there are, with? yes sir, there are some, some grant programs out there. In many respects, they're modeled after the original Chesapeake Bay Act, where uh, if you're hiring additional staff, they will provide you some supplemental funding uh, for some period of time. I think we all expected that perhaps from that Chesapeake Bay mandate that that funding would be a little more long term than it really was. And at the end of the day, the localities ended up absorbing uh, those costs. 
They have adopted a, a fee schedule and allowed localities the flexibility to amend the, fle the fee schedule as they see fit to, to support the new stormwater programs. Um, there are actually three different permitting levels with this new program. There's one program under 20, there's one set of standards under 2,500 square feet. There's, there's a Virginia permitting program between 2,500 square feet and one acre. And then there is a, a federal permitting program under EPA tied to the Chesapeake Bay for development that, that's over an acre in size. Um, so yes, there are some funding opportunities, not necessarily permanent, but in the form of grants. There is the fee schedule that the board can adopt to cover the cost of the program. Um, and we continue to, to look at those as we go forward. Thank you. That's all. And I'll ask Ms. Cosby if the board doesn't mind if she has anything that she'd like to add. She's been involved in this as well. I don't think I have anything to add. I think Mike summed it up pretty well. It is a very complicated process, um, but one that, you know, is, is required by the state. And so um, I think just knowing that staff is, you know, is working to get those deadlines so that you'll have all of the information. You know, that's just the key, <coughs> making sure that you are comfortable with what's going on by those deadline times so when the program, you know, goes live next year, you know, we might not all like it, but at least we know, you know, what it is and why we're doing it. And I'm happy to answer any questions, you know, with staff on, on any of these issues. Okay. Um, Mr. Fincham, I just wanted to follow up in your, in your opening and, and in our summary. This was a decision by the General Assembly at last year's session. Prior to that, didn't the Department of Environmental Quality handle all stormwater issues? There is a state stormwater program that was implemented by the Department of Conservation and Recreation several years ago. That will be transferred, the oversight of that program will be transferred to DEQ. The actual administration of that program will be shifted down to local government. Right. Yes, sir. So what I, what I was saying without really saying it is this is basically an unfunded mandate with a couple of grant dollars out there based on what the General Assembly has decided to do. So, so again, the localities will bear the brunt of funding, financing a program that's coming from the state. And as we all know, localities have enough to fund with their own public schools and public safety issues to not have more given to us from the state without money. And oh, by the way, you will give 28% of your fees collected back to the state so that they can look over our shoulder um, in administering the program. You just like kicking me when I'm down, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, needless to say, I don't feel happy about that, but that's another story. Mr. Steele, you want to add on well, to that? Is this similar to the Maryland rain tax that we're now going to get involved in? I'm, I'm not sure, Mr. Seeley. What I can tell you is that some years back, um, EPA was sued uh, over its, under the Clean Water Act, for failure to clean up the Chesapeake Bay. There, the, the, there was then an executive order directing EPA to adopt a program to clean up the Chesapeake Bay, of which Virginia, the other states, and, and the District of Columbia are co-signatures to that agreement. The EPA is, and, and there, it was in, uh, it's been in the news several times where the EPA required cleanup plans from Virginia to meet new nutrient limits in the bay on point and non-point sources of pollution. 
all of these programs are designed to uh, implement, at the, at the end of the day, to implement that cleanup plan for the Chesapeake Bay. Mr. Mr. French, Mr. Chairman. I, don't, I mean, from what I gather from going to the Rappahannock uh, Basin Commission meetings, which are, as you know, very long and sometimes tedious, isn't this very similar to cap and trade? Um, say if, for example, uh, I mean, seriously, I mean, it, it really is. I mean, we were talking about the air pollution. If Fredericksburg, the city of Fredericksburg, for example, you know, in the Rappahannock River has excess pollution or whatever, and we do not, can't we kind of swap credits between localities and entities? I mean, that's kind of some of the, the gist that I got out of it. Uh, from a nutrient perspective, in some cases, that's correct. And I think Mr. Schiebel, under our current wastewater treatment plan and our allocations for discharges of that plant, there is a similar program where we can, and, and correct me if I use the wrong terminology, Joey, actually purchase nutrient credits to offset what we are discharging into the, the receiving body of water. And he's nodding his head, so I think I got that right. But he, that is probably a good analogy to use, that there is a cap that's placed on the nutrients that can be discharged sure. into the receiving water body, sure. the Chesapeake Bay. That's then allocated by watershed, which is then allocated by the users or dischargers and uh, discharges into the, the receiving water body. Um, and if you don't meet those nutrient limits, then there are some programs available that can be utilized to, to mitigate that. Kind of ironic. So in some respects, that, that's a good analogy. Yes, sir. I just find it ironic, but th thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fincham. We will look forward to uh, more information from you. Okay. Uh, ch ch appointments. Building Code, Board of Appeals, Reedy Church, and Madison. I would like to make a motion that uh, we pass on to the judge, to the courts, mm -hmm. the name of David David Napier. David Napier. Yes. Mm -hmm. Napier. Mm -hmm. David Napier. Napier. Second. Second. Motion made by Mr. Akers, seconded by Mr. Underwood, that we recommend to the judge the name of David Napier for the Madison Building Code Board of Appeals. Discussion. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed nay. That motion carries unanimously. Mr. Um, Chairman. Yes, sir. You're actually appointing that position. Does BZA. Not have to go to the court. BZA, we BZA. go to court. This one we're appointing. Chairman, so we'll change. modify your motion. To appoint modify your appoint. second. Make sure, again, all in favor say aye. Don't go aye. Mr. Aye. Fincham. Aye. Mr. Fincham, can you, uh, can you come back for a second? So that motion carries unanimously still. Mr. Taylor is absent. Um, Planning Commission Mattapanai is my appointment uh, next, and, and that expires in October. Yes, sir. Is there a provision that allows the sitting uh, member of the Planning Commission to continue until a new one is appointed? Yes, sir. Okay, because what I would like to do, I'm going to ask you and Mr. Cully to work together. I would like you to get a description of Planning Commission duties, meeting times, and we're going to advertise that position. Okay. So we're going to we're going to put that in progress and possibly the freelance star if we can. And within the next 30 days, we should have a pool of names, and we'll select from those names. Okay. And then Mr. Uh, Mr. Bush can continue to serve until that appointment is made. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, IDA, IDA, perfect timing. Poor. Yes. For the appointment for Reedy Church, could we ask the. Uh, Mr. Fincham to may give us a little help with that <coughs> appointment. We're having a little difficulty yes. there. Mr. Fincham, if you could give us some help, Mr. Fincham, with finding a, a person for the uh, building code board appeals. You want some additional names? Yes. Yes, sir. Well, okay. I haven't gotten the first one. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Taylor, Industrial Development Authority, Port Royal. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to wait uh, until the next meeting. I'm, I need to talk a little bit more before okay. I make that appointment. Okay. And we also have for the board, 
an IDA at large member that is an appointment also. Any thoughts on those? Mr. Chairman, Ray uh, Ratliff has a 